So I asked myself, of course, after you know, being invited by Fogma to this uh, customer and supplier conference of Bosch, you know, what the hell I should talk about because you know, we are a boring logistics company and you have seen the innovation power of Bosch and, and Daimler just a couple of minutes ago, so what can I contribute to that? So the best explanation maybe is because I'm a scientist, maybe that's the reason. The better explanation is probably that I brought something with me and if your colleagues help me now, you will see it in a second what I brought with me. So, um, you know, this is what we call a street scooter, and this is about future of mobility to a certain extent. So, if I talk about this street scooter, uh, you know, it has quite history because, you know, we started to think about this kind of stuff already in 2011. Uh, and that gives you a good insight in what, how disruptive technology can be for certain parts of the world, and it tells us as well how disruptive maybe technology might be for ourselves as well. I come to that later on when I talk about our own business somehow. So when we started that journey in 2010-11, you know, m my colleague who is really uh, the godfather of that product um, uh, has said, you know, we need definitely sooner or later carbon-free, um, emission-free cars in the center of the cities because that might happen sooner or later that it's not allowed. Um, we need a car, and we have a perfect application with stop and go for such a vehicle because you know this is what we are doing on a daily basis on a big scale with delivering letters and parcels around the world. Uh, so let's do that. So of course we had discussions with OEMs. Uh, the problem with the OEMs is that yes, we are a large player with 50,000 demand, but you know, we are a niche because, you know, that is pretty unique, that demand somehow. And we don't need a car which can drive faster than 80 kilometers per hour. The reach doesn't have to be longer than 100 kilometers. It doesn't need air conditioning and we need it only in one color anyway, which you can see here. <laughs> so if you then sit as an OEM there and say, you know, that's great, but, you know, that's not a big market for us. So we found a small startup as a spin-off of the RWTH Aachen, and we said, okay, we need that. Let's design the two-hour cross. So we started the journey. We have now 5,500 cars on the street. We are selling that to third party, um, and we have a nice benefit that this car, if that has been done by any OEM, the yellow press would be all over the world and say, this is just ridiculous. This is not customer centric. This car is only 80 kilometers fast, can only drive 100 kilometers, has no air conditioning, and is only available in three colors. This is not customer centricity. We, <laughs> we have the benefit of doubt. So we are in a new entrance, and the new entrance gets all the benefit of doubt. And that happens. It comes from customers, it comes from counties, it comes from governments, it comes from the press. That tells us as well how disruptive to technology can be also for our own business. Because whoever wanna do logistics, if he does something smart, or we say, oh, that doesn't make any sense for us, you know, a small startup will get all the benefit of doubt from customers, from the press, from governments, and we should be very cautious that we are not believing that something like that can't happen to our industry. So that's the history of the street scooter. We are very proud of that, of course, that we created that. Uh, it's on total cost of ownership already break even to a classical combustion engine because, you know, we don't need that many batteries to drive that thing. And our employees are pretty happy and proud that we do that. So we not only do that, we also look into the whole area of products we need. You know, this is one we deploy massively in the UK, a teardrop um, um, thing where you really save a lot of fuel, five to 10%. We also have developed with a new startup, a foil, a solar panel foil, which you can put on top of the roof. And again, it pushes energy into the car when necessary for cooling, 
you know, for you know, battery recharging or whatsoever. Again, a very simple solution, um, and we are a system integrator of that, so we are looking constantly. And why we are doing that is <coughs> because in 2008, <coughs> when I got into the office, we felt we are a big emitter of carbon, and we have to change that. We have to commit ourselves to something. So in 2008, we committed ourselves to reduce our carbon footprint on a global scale or make us more efficient by 30%. So we operate more than 250 white bodies, and we are shipping a lot of air freight and belly space of air, many airplanes. So we said we have to do something about that. We started, we achieved our goal to re increase our efficiency by 2020 already, by 30% by 2020 already 2016. So last spring, my colleagues and I were sitting together after COP21 took place already in 2015, and we said, or 2016, sorry, no, it's 15, and we were in 16, so we said, what should we do now? The good news for all of you who are producing or involved in car manufacturing, truck manufacturing, airplane manufacturing, whatsoever, we expect that we will have zero carbon emission by 2050. So politicians can say, we want to have more cars, we want to have more airplanes, we will tell you, we will buy. And whoever is first will make the deal. And that's our responsibility as large corporations, that we demand what we want to see to solve the global warming problem. That is our commitment. Whoever will be first having carbon-free airplanes will make the business. Whoever has the first carbon-free trucks will make the business. Of course, they have to be competitive viable. You know, you can't just produce something and say, you know, we will die in, in good hope. Uh, so we have to make business as well. But we are very much committed and we are very sure that this is doable with a timeline of more than 30 years. So. <laughs> of course, you have to measure interimistly as well. That's the reason why we want to be more carbon efficient by 50% under 2025. We want to do 70% of our last mile delivery carbon neutral. We will train our people and we will plant a million trees every year. We did that already last year in the first half because we, we, you know, we started only really mid-year. So we will continue to do that. So again, for all of you who are really interested in to reduce your carbon footprint, we will wait for your solutions. Politicians have to set you know, goals to limit the carbon emission to 2%, two, to zero, 2 degrees Celsius. They have done that. It's now up to the global players to meet our own targets. And now it's engineers and scientists have to find the right solutions. And I have no doubt that humans will do that. So beyond that, there's other stuff. <coughs> but our industry is in very much in transformation as well. So we are looking into all these trends which are happening, be it autonomous driving, Actually, I like that very much for wally parking. We are having already a street scooter as well on our pilot plant, uh, which is autonomously driving. If you can do wally parking, why you can't do that a, that a van, a career van, is falling a career on the street with maximum six kilometers per hour? Because you know, we have mailmen walking the street, delivering parcel. They have to go back into the front of the van every stop and drive. This is waste. So why should they not just walk the street and the nice street scooter is following them autonomously with maximum six kilometers per hour, like you do that probably in volley parking, valley parking as well. So that is what we are working already on. And I have to say, there are quite a lot of Bosch things in that car as well. So we are not have invented everything. <laughs> so all you think about trading platforms for freight, which is happening now or cloud services in our industry. You know, you can read that all, you are more familiar with that than I. You know, a lot of stuff is happening. There is uh, actually no limitations to imagine as what is possible with new technology, and that's fantastic. And of course, we have to adapt that. How do we do that? So, uh, you know, the job of CEOs is usually to make things which are apparently complex, make them easy, because then they are understandable for employees. So what we do, and tell the, our organization all this is, we have to do three things, actually. 
we have to explain that we need innovation for our processes to make them more customer-centric, more effective, and more effective and more efficient. We call that small i. Small innovations. Technology hits the existing processes and make them more customer-centric, efficient, or effective. After we introduce that, people say, oh, now I understand what big data means for me, and now I understand what this technology means for me, because they understand now, instead of this is a myth, digitalization is a big myth, had nothing to do with myself, it's all it, the data scientists should do that, I have nothing to do with that. They understood, and now even our real estate people are thinking constantly about adapting digital stuff to our operations. The second is, you have to think about how you ad apply new technology for business exploration which we call big I. So this is more tricky because, you know, you can try a lot, but if you have no, what I call, unfair competitive advantage, you will fail. So what is our unfair competitive advantage with this one? Our unfair competitive advantage is that we exactly know what we need and we have a demand of 50,000 vehicles and we don't care if Sabiani says, this doesn't have an air conditioning and it drives fast. This is our unfair competitive advantage, and that's the reason why it flies. This is true for other aspects as well. So whatever we do, we are saying, don't do anything you do, because we will never be as smart as a startup. We can't burn as much money as venture capitalists, because we have shareholders who are expecting a return on a quarterly basis and want to see that. But what we can do is we can use our unfair competitive advantage, whatever that is, for ourselves, and I will show you another example in a minute. So let me start with a small idea, oh sorry, and then finally, of course, you have to change the culture. And that has something to do with leadership, but also other aspects, and I'll give you some insights in that as well in a second. So the first is um, small I ideas. So this is our autonomous post spot, which is follows autonomously our mailman. So we have that live in a pilot in Germany, it works pretty well. Our, our mailmen are very thrilled. They don't have to carry anything any longer that carries 150 uh, kilograms, which is, you know, that makes the job of our mailmen significantly easier. And this is what I tell our employees around the world as well. Digitalization is the best news for our industry. Our industry has not changed their processes, has not automated our jobs for probably the last 50 years. Yes, we have scanners. We have automated forklifts and all this kind of stuff. But if you look into the basics, we are still doing the same like 50 years ago. Why is that a problem? Because US potential customers are demanding every year, you know, cost improvements quite a bit. You want to have cost reductions, you know, in a system where you can't generate productivity gains easily, that's a tough game. So we are fighting, you know, we are challenged by our customers constantly give us more productivity gains. Now it will happen. Why is the automotive industry paying significantly higher salaries than the logistics industry? Because the automotive industry captured tremendous productivity gains. And we haven't. This will change the world now for us as well. These things and others, I'll show you some other examples, will make our jobs much more productive, which creates opportunities to give something to our customers give some things to our employees, and of course our shareholders want to have some benefits as well. So that's one example. The other example is this one. Uh, Dieter mentioned that already, we do that with smart trunk delivery. You know, this is the guarantee that there are no failed deliveries. We still have failed deliveries because people are not at home, or they change their mind, and whatsoever. So this works very easily with IoT and other stuff, that our careers get the information where the car is, that he can identify that easily through the blinking of a car, that he gets information to open the trunk, put the parcels in, lock the trunk, and it's, you know, very young people, many young people drive these smart cars, they are thrilled. That's really top technology combining what, you know, Bosch does, what Daimler does, what we do, and I think it's a fantastic uh, innovation. It makes our processes significantly more effective and efficient. The third example is augmented reality. So these famous smart glasses, you know, it's probably not very practical if you are a consumer, but it's very practical in our warehouses. We have developed a solution where our pick and pack, our colleagues are using those. 
we get 15% productivity enhancements, 15, one, five. Usually we fight for one or two. And our employees are excited. You know, we are now beyond the pilot stage. We are now rolling it out as a standard in our warehouses where it makes sense. Not everywhere it makes sense, but in places where it makes sense, it really makes a significant difference. So these are what we call small eyes ideas, and there will be hundreds of these ideas to reinvent supply chain solutions, without a doubt. The other one is more the big eye ideas, so how you uh, explore new ideas. And you, know, you have read about these trading platforms for cargo as well. So this is our own solution, Saludo. Um, and you know, we, we believe that we can make it happen, that we really create visibilities for shippers and truckers and combine them. What is our core competence and our competitive advantage? The data. Whenever you put as a shipper a shipment on the platform, we guarantee you that you will get a quote because we have the data. Many of these platforms are coming to us and say, oh, we want to work with you together. We need your data. We have the data already. We can use that to guarantee that every shipper who puts a pallet on that portal will get a quote. He might not be excited about the price, and that will be worked out. Therefore, you know, it's a journey. But we believe that we have here a competitive advantage, and that's the reason why we started that. It might cannibalize our core. But I tell our colleagues all the time, if you have an idea which cannibalizes your core, you be it's better that we are doing it ourselves before we get substituted by somebody else. Because if we have the idea, somebody else will be smart and have the same idea at least. So this is what we do with a digital freight platform. This is what we call the big eye ideas. In addition, so being a little bit an old-fashioned company with doing logistics, we also started what for you is completely normal as engineers. We have now our own startup lab. And we asked the whole global organization with 520,000 people, you know, what can we do, what we should do differently? And we asked them, and we got in the first run 150 business ideas, 150 business ideas. We were overwhelmed. We have chosen now eight to get funding uh, from the group to innovate something. And they are great ideas. Some of them, I have no doubt, you will see sooner or later somewhere in the world, you know, implemented in our operations because it's just fantastic. And these are people from the shop floor level, from middle management, from countries. So this is what we are doing. Of course, we are working with partners like Plug and Play together as well to get new ideas. That's the cultural part. The more important part is not for up to date. It's you know, how you lead an organization. We have developed a very comprehensive leadership model where we are measured on as leaders, and we also train them very intensively. Otherwise, you can't facilitate the change. So to come to the end, uh, future of mobility, it will change. I think you know, digitalization is a fantastic idea. We assessed. You know, and that's, that's the good news at the end of it. You just read that. We assess ourselves how much jobs might disappear in our industry through digitalization. Our best guess is currently one third until 2030. So the journalists among you will not write, I say one third of the jobs will be gone. But don't forget, until 2030, we will be growing more than 30%. And if that's not doable, you know, the supervisory board should be better fire me today than tomorrow. So we will grow faster. So without a doubt, we will have more jobs and better jobs by 2030. We will have more and better jobs thanks to digitalization. And that's my basic belief. This is what I tell internally and when I have an opportunity to, talk, to say that externally. So that's the idea. And that's the reason why I want to finish with two things which are reported to me as well. And, uh, you know, we have a very clear purpose. We are connecting people, improving lives, and we do that every day. And that's so important for me. That's I'm proud of to lead an organization who makes such a big difference for so many people. And I'm very much an optimist. You know, I believe we have never been in a better place than now, and we together can make that world even a better place. We need your innovation. Thank you very much for your attention.